Well, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to have you here for the second part of what we were discussing last week. Uh, this will be, I hope, my last screencast. And next week, I hope to do a Facebook Live featuring mentor texts, how to spot them, how to use them. But today, we're going to talk about the rest of Target from Naked Reading. So this is part two of targeting readers. And we start with G. G is still for guidance. But we're thinking about guidance in, in two different ways. We're thinking about Reader's Advisory, and we're thinking about reading ladders. You can see how my books start be, becoming interconnected uh, because I'll finish one and then I'll go, oh, you know what? We also need to focus on this. So three books came out that way. When we talk about Reader's Advisory, I always think of it as something similar to a reference interview. Um, and so some of the questions I ask, and they may be a little different from the ones you ask, but some of the questions I ask are, what was the last book you read and liked? And what was it that you liked about the book? Uh, because somebody will say, well, I liked this book, and you don't really get much else. Well, I liked it because it's a mystery. Okay, but what kind of mystery was it? And why did you like this particular kind of mystery? So I keep kind of poking around a little to get some more specific things. Is it because it was um, not violent, because it was, you know, everything off screen in terms of things that happen to the characters? Uh, did you like that or did you like it more on screen, more you get to see the stuff that's going on that's dangerous? So I ask them that. And um, I also asked the other one, what would you despise reading? So is there a book that you ultimately would just reject? If so, what is it? And what would make you reject it? Um, I also ask, is there a form or format that you either like or do not like? Please excuse the typo there. Um, <laughs> uh, who knows why spell check didn't pick that up. So basically what I'm asking is, would you like a graphic novel, a novel in verse, uh, nonfiction? Uh, do you want realistic fiction? You know, I'll go through different genres and subgenres. I just want to make sure that I get as close to what this student wants as I can. Is length a requirement? In other words, not for a teacher, but for you. Do you want a short book? Or does length really not matter at all? And is there anything else I should know? about what you want in books. So if I keep asking questions, I'm probably going through that little file folder we keep up in our head, and I'm eliminating some books because they're just not going to meet the need of, of this reader. So I, I want to be as careful as I can to pick a book they'll like. Remember that three strikes and you're out kind of thing? It comes in right here. So. Uh, in order to avoid making even one strike, I want to ask as many questions in advance as I can. There's reading ladders. Um, and that's the second half of guiding readers. I don't mind giving readers a couple, three, four suggestions. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'd rather be doing the suggesting than, than just kind of wandering aimlessly around the library. But eventually, that onus has to be on them. I've given you several books that you like. Now let's talk about maybe creating a reading ladder. Can you take the book you like and figure out what comes next, what comes next, what comes next? So if you liked a graphic novel and you liked a, a slender graphic, four-color, uh, realistic novel, then could you build to a graphic piece of nonfiction? Could you build to... Um, a graphic kind of classic retelling, like the ones of Shakespeare and Beowulf and those kinds of things. Can we build you up as we're looking at these kind of books? The idea is not to make the books harder, uh, but eventually to make them a little bit more complex, maybe a little bit more rewarding for them. I don't ever want to make this hard. And if you look even at the cover, I think that is suggested. We've got ladder after ladder after ladder to help them climb to the next book, the next book, the next book. I don't ever want to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until they kind of fall off and uh, fall away from me. So guidance in includes both. It includes, let me go ahead and ask you the kind of things you might want in a book, but let me, after that, 
show you how to create kind of a reading ladder, how to find the next book you're going to read and the next book. Granted, if you have problems in this kind of second stage, come back. Uh, I'll be happy to kind of help you get this next reading ladder underway. So uh, you can see lots of different kinds of ladders. We've got a short ladder right here. Uh, it only has basically three steps on it. So we're building a really short ladder. And you can see that, in, in my mind at least, a reading ladder is a mix of thematic units with horizontal or vertical alignment. So we're looking at the ladder that goes up. We're looking at a ladder that kind of builds a piece of scaffolding. We're looking at a ladder that goes way up. So when you're making those first ladders, that's kind of up to you, whether you want to have that horizontal alignment, whether you want to do a very short vertical alignment, or whether you want to go for broke and go for it all. Up to you. So what we know and the reason that we're talking about this is that avid readers make connections between and among text. So uh, when I'm reading, when you're reading probably, as you're reading you're going, oh, you know, this reminds me of. And we'll do that frequently. We'll say, you know, that there's, there's a character here that reminds me of a character over here. Or there's kind of the sentence structure that reminds me of the sentence structure over here. We make connections. It helps us then form our own reading ladders, do our own kind of guidance, uh, if we know that we're looking for those kind of things. When a student comes to us and says, I want another book just like this, it means that they're looking for a book that's going to help them make connections. So ask, well, what does this mean? You know, do you want another book in this form, format? See, we go back to that reading interview kind of thing. You can demonstrate and then have kids create their own reading ladders. So oft often when I read, if the book belongs to me, I'll make notes in the pages. But if uh, the book doesn't belong to me or I want to let it float on, I'll use some post-it notes and I'll make little uh, notes for myself that say, this reminds me of Bridge to Terabithia. I wonder if there's another book like that that can go on my ladder. Um, and if so, what kind of things must it meet? What kind of criteria am I looking for? E. E used to be for enthusiasm. And I certainly think that we need to be enthusiastic about books. Don't get me wrong. A child will be able to understand and be able to, to see and feel if we're suggesting a book that either we haven't read or we haven't liked very much. So enthusiasm is still important, but I think much more important is to find those books that develop empathy. Empathy is really stronger than sympathy at this point. Um, while I'm creating these PowerPoints and doing these discussions, we're in quarantine, um, although it's kind of loosening up a little, but we've been in quarantine for about a month and a month and a half, I guess. And there are books that will help develop that empathy of being stuck somewhere, of being um, unable to do certain things, of being forced to take on new challenges. Uh, even though we're not ready for them. So what we're looking for are books that will help our readers bond with the protagonist, see the point of view of others as well. Uh, and that's all part of a morality element. Uh, I'm not doing it consciously. This is not, you know, pushing religion or anything else. This is simply saying, look, here's a person who's trapped in some way, like you feel trapped. Let's see what this person does to help kind of dig his or her way out. What we're trying to do is create that empathetic bond and then give students other kinds of things that they might do when they find themselves in a situation that's not very good. Uh, I'll also say that empathetic people, empathetic teens, empathetic adults, uh, tend to treat others with much more respect tend not to do things that are rude because they understand that this is a person too. It could very well have been me. So if I treat this person nicely, hopefully they'll turn around and, and pay it forward, if you will. So I'm looking for books that help develop empathy. 
and T, the last T used to be tween and teen appeal. And again, certainly important, but I think nothing is as important as time, time to read. You know the old saying, so many books, so little time. And I feel that way sometimes. I look, I look around the room where I'm sitting and there are literally hundreds of books, um, including a big pile on the floor that I intend to get to at some point. And I have more time because we're not leaving the house, but I still need more time. And one of the things I need to do is set aside time to read by making it a priority and a routine. Uh, one of the ways I do that, by the way, is um, this quarantine period, we formed a book club. And it's a bunch of um, fellow reading teachers and uh, people who do PD. We've got a couple librarians. And we meet usually once a week and talk about a book that we've read. We all agree on then the next book to read. And next time we, again, talk about that. Just knowing that in a week, I need to participate in a conference about a book makes that a priority, makes me take some time every day to either read or listen to the book that we're going to talk about. Time spent reading, you notice I'm going backwards here for a minute, time spent reading is instructional. I used to have um, administrators who would come into the room when kids were doing silent reading and say, I'll come back when you're teaching. And that, you know, that bothered me a lot. I had to talk to them a little bit and say, you know, this, this is instructional time. As kids are reading, <coughs> excuse me, as kids are reading, they're pulling up vocabulary, they're using context clues, they're basically using, utilizing all the things that we have talked about in our reading classes. So it is instructional time. It's not just curl up with a book on the floor, uh, although that's part of it too. It's, it's kind of fun. So it is instructive in some way. You need to share this importance of time with your colleagues, first of all. Uh, when I first started doing, <coughs> excuse me, when I first started uh, doing after um, recess reading, a little swig of water might help that. Um, not been talking much, so when I do, <coughs> it irritates me. Anyhow, when I first started doing this, uh, I was teaching in an open concept school, and I, I kind of warned my colleagues on either side. I said, when we come back from recess, we're going to take the first 15 minutes of class and just read. So, you know, my students would come in hot and sweaty, flop down on the floor, find a pillow, find a, a, a beanbag chair, whatever, um, and start reading because they knew that if they didn't do that, if they didn't adhere to the rules, then we weren't going to have silent reading time. Well, it wasn't long before students who were in the classrooms on either side, remember no walls, would look and say, well, how come her class gets to kind of lie down and sleep after recess? Because that's pretty much what they saw. And their teacher said, well, you want to do it? It's, it's reading time. I can do that too. We all have the same schedule. And so their kids would do that as well. So I started by getting one colleague and then another and then another. And eventually that went to the administration who asked basically the same kind of comment. Why are your kids just reading? Just, you know, reading. Why aren't you doing instructional kinds of things? And I had to share research with them that shows that time spent reading is instructional that kids who are being read aloud to or have time for free reading tend to do better on tests, all those good things like that. And then finally, to share that with caregivers, parents, whoever's in charge when kids get home, that it's good to have time at home to read as well. So time is kind of of essence. I'm sure you've seen this graph in probably four different, four or five different ways. I like this one because it actually shows you books. Uh, why can't I skip my 20 minutes of reading tonight? If student A reads 20 minutes a day, they read 3,600 minutes in a school year. That's 
1.8 million words, and they score in the 90th percentile. Student B reads five minutes a day. That's 900 minutes in a school year. It's 282,000 words a year, and they score in about the 50th percentile, half score better, half score worse. Student C reads maybe one minute a day or maybe none. He reads 180 minutes in a school year, that's 8,000 words, and that tends to put him or her in the 10th reading percentile. So by the end of sixth grade, student A will have read the equivalent of 60 whole school days, student B 12 school days. So who would you expect to be a more avid reader, to have a more advanced vocabulary, to have a wider range of reading interests? That's why that 20 minutes, 15 minutes at school, maybe 20 minutes at home, that's where that starts building up reading stamina, as well as skills and vocabulary. So what does all this mean? When we look at target from the very beginning, it means our target as educators is to create and support readers. We need to create them first, and if they come to us already created, hallelujah, then we just need to keep supporting them, providing some scaffold, and eventually removing the scaffold till they become independent readers. That's what Target is all about. That's what a lot of the things that we do in our classrooms are all about. So next week, I'm going to talk about mentor texts, how to choose them, and how to use them.